For the Ohio State Buckeyes, 1968 was the ultimate dream season. Behind a collection of young stars known as the Super Sophomores, the Buckeyes stormed through the regular season undefeated and finished the season ranked number one. But before the celebration was complete, one last challenge remained, the USC Trojans and a New Year's Day battle in the granddaddy of them all, the Rose Bowl. Ohio State's victory over Southern Cal in the 1969 Rose Bowl was a climactic moment in what is perhaps the greatest season in Ohio State football history. I think the 68 team was, was the finest football team as a group I have ever seen. It was just the, you know, a magical time when everybody got put together in the same place and good things happened. The win was the culmination of a season built on key senior leadership, brilliant team chemistry, and a group of talented young phenoms known as the Super Sophomores. You know, these, these kids, the sophomores, they were fearless. <laughs> they didn't have a history of even worrying about anything. They were just, these kids were players. We were good, but we just didn't know how good we could be. That was basically it. We were young and dumb. The arrival of the Super Sophs injected new life into a program that was in danger of collapse. The high State, it, when we showed up, was on the ropes, you know, sort of. They had, they had a six and three season. I think they had a, I don't know what the season before might have been worse. Uh, a lot of talk about Coach Hayes, you know, getting rid of by Woody, uh, you, know, you know, airplanes flying overhead and all that. A lot of the people around town were saying it, and maybe some sports writers in other places, that the game has passed Woody by. And this, this sort of stuck in his craw. He, he heard this, and he wouldn't, he wouldn't acknowledge that he ever read the newspapers, but he did. Hearing all the hoopla from the, the fans and, and the press and all that uh, during that time, it just made all the team, uh, all the people on the team, kind of gather around and, and rally around Willie's cause. The embattled Hayes knew that if he could survive the 67 season, 1968 could be something special. Woody's optimism was rooted in what he and many observers saw as his greatest recruiting class ever. Woody did a wonderful job in building it up because he was telling all of us as we were being recruited, this is going to be a great class. You know, you're coming in and you're going to have an opportunity to play. That opportunity had to wait due to mandatory freshman ineligibility. But even while ineligible, the young freshman made an impact. We actually practiced against our freshman team coming in, which was the super sophomore class on the 68 team. And I think that was a real turning point for us. I think the, you know, we practiced against these kids who were great athletes, and it really raised the level of our, uh, of our team's ability. We just kind of took it to heart that they weren't playing up to what we thought they should be playing up to being a uh, Big Ten school. And we, we just decided to push them a little bit in practice. It was like a racehorse. We as freshmen were sitting in the box ready to be released, and we just wanted that chance. We wanted that chance, and I know it had to be tough on uh, Woody and the staff because they knew what they had, and they just <laughs> wanted to get the season over, but uh, the old man had to win out in order to save his job. And he was really, really stressing, stressing us. It was real tough. But we finished strong, and, and by the end of that year, we were, we were a really tough football team in 67. We really were. The 1967 Buckeyes went on to win their final four games, and the returning players knew that the best was yet to come. I don't think anybody on that team would have ever predicted that, hey, next year we're going to be national champions. But I think a lot of people could have gone home after the season was over and said, you know, we're going to really be competitive next year because we got something special that nobody knows about. And that's that super sophomore class. During the offseason, the walls between the upper and lower classmen came down, and the team began to gel. There was enough leadership with the older fellows, though, that rather than resenting us, they saw that in the future that we could help them. And so they accepted us. We got very, very close with the, with the varsity players so that when we came in as sophomores, we didn't feel like we were not part of the team. I don't think they ever looked at those guys as sophomores. I don't think they looked at us as juniors. I think we just looked at each other as, as, as a football team. This was a, a group of guys that really played well together. And they practiced hard. Everybody competed in practice against everybody. Uh, uh, and I think that carried over. By fall, the Buckeyes were ready for show. Wins over SMU and Oregon set the stage for one of Ohio State's greatest wins ever, 
A 13 to nothing upset over top ranked Purdue. The stunning victory avenged an embarrassing 41 to 6 loss to the Boilers just one year earlier and made the case that the Buckeyes were back. That's probably one of the great games of Ohio State history that, that, that turned, turned the tradition around to where, you know, when you go into that stadium, you, you know, you better be ready because we're going to come out and get you. That game gave us the edge, and then we believed, you know, that, you know, we could win. We could win. Don't know how, but we're going to win. One by one, the conference opponents began to fall. Illinois and Michigan State provided scares, but the Buckeyes always found ways to win. By Michigan, the Buckeyes were running at full stride. In the biggest game of the year, the Buckeyes blew open a 21 to 14 halftime lead and routed the Wolverines 50 to 14. There was a touchdown here and a touchdown there, an interception and a fumble, and before you know it, it almost was like the game got out of hand. And uh, we couldn't believe what, we, what was going on. To have your best game of the season in the biggest game of the season, uh, it was a, a marvelous, marvelous experience. The Michigan win lifted the Buckeyes to number one in the polls and set up the ultimate showdown in college football's most prestigious game, Ohio State versus USC, number one against number two, playing for history in the granddaddy of them all, the Rose Bowl. Ohio State's convincing 50-14 defeat of arch-rival Michigan raised the Buckeyes' record to 9-0 and elevated them to the top spot in the nation's wire service polls. It also set up a New Year's Day Rose Bowl showdown against the nation's number two team, the USC Trojans. Ohio State coach Woody Hayes knew the Trojans would be his team's toughest test yet. He wasted little time putting his players back to work. One week, we went on uh, for the break. And we came back, and uh, from then on, it was like two a days. And it was tough. We were having two a days. We were having two a days, man. That's just to get us in shape, to get us ready. One of our minds right, my mind was right. For Woody, no amount of work was too much, no detail too small. Before we went out, we had some practice over at the French field house. Woody had that French field house up to 90 degrees. It was horrible. Yeah, we were going to California, so he wanted to make sure that we were going to be in shape when we got out there in that California heat, so he turned up the heat. He always used to tell us that if you're going to fight in the Atlantic, you got to train in the Atlantic. So we went inside very few times, but uh, nobody wanted to go inside because if you did, you just knew you were going to get beat up. And he got mad because people weren't uh, playing hard enough on the, on, the, on the surface we were on. And he said, by God, full speed. Well, full speed back then meant tackling and everything. So I mean, it's like you're tackling out on the parking lot, and that's the way it was. By that time, he had kind of got used to dealing with Woody and pretty much what Woody wanted, Woody did. But, you know, this is the first time we're going to California. We're going out and play OJ in Southern California. So basically, here, it didn't matter. You know, we, we were just doing what we had to do to get to California after they got to the West Coast that Hayes uh, wanted the players to be away from all the limelight and to uh, be away from all the Hollywood attractions as much as possible. I mean, we got out there, we got right on the bus, went right to the, to the field we were supposed to practice on. They said, put full pads on, and we went out and scrimmaged the first day we were out there. We had our meetings in the morning, we practiced in the afternoon, we had our meetings in the evening, and we got about an hour and a half maybe two hours of free time in the evening, so there wasn't a whole lot of time. We enjoyed ourselves as much as we could, but we knew we was there for one, 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 uh, one mission, and that was to win this uh, national championship. And we knew we could do that if we could take USC and, uh, and uh, O.J. Simpson. Simpson came into the game as the winner of that season's Heisman Trophy and was widely regarded as the most explosive college running back in years. He was a piece of work, and what he was uh, was geared for O.J. Simpson. Uh, he, he, was, uh, he was not afraid of them, but he geared his offense and defense uh, around being able to stop uh, O.J. Simpson. And one thing about O.J. Simpson is I told the players, you better tackle the small numbers on the front. Because if you try to tackle O.J.'s big numbers, means you're chasing them, it isn't going to happen. We wanted to keep him on to the, to the short side of the field because he was so shifty. And he got stronger as the game went on. Uh, you could hit him uh, 50 times. 
And that 51st time, he's going to be that much stronger. He's going to break it for a touchdown. From the game's first play, the Trojans put Simpson to work. As it was all year, the SC game plan was simple. Run OJ early and often. By the second quarter, Simpson's talents were on full display. Two key receptions helped drive the Trojans to the OSU two-yard line. An inspired goal line stand held the Trojans to a field goal. But on the first play of their next possession, Simpson made one of the Rose Bowl's great runs. I remember turning around and chasing him, and I'm going, man, just try to stay close, because they're going to say, where the hell are you in the uh, pitch in the film? And I saw Jack Tatum, which he could run a 4-5 or five all day long. I could see him having him cut him off at the pass, and he blew by him, and I said, there's no way. I said, just keep running, because ain't nobody going to catch this guy, you know? And he was gone. Simpson's 80-yard sprint gave the Trojans a 10-0 lead. The Buckeyes' biggest deficit of the year. But yeah, we were concerned, but it was never a panic situation. Uh, we, we did not have to ever play from behind that entire year. So I think that there was some questions as to uh, how are we going to respond. That was a wake-up call. You know, gosh, we, uh, we were playing tentative. I know I was playing a little tentative. And, uh, you know, maybe, maybe my teammates were picking that up for me, and they were playing tentative. And when O.J. ran it, it was just like, hey, guys, that's it. Time for us to play. Playing old-fashioned Woody Hayes football, the Buckeyes began to march down the field. A 20-yard pass to Ray Gillian moved the ball to the Trojans, too. And on second down, Jim Otis dove into the end zone for the Buckeyes' first score. We did not get out of our game plan at all, and we stayed with it. We stayed with it because that's all we had to do, and we stayed in our game plan, and we, we just took the football down and scored. We responded the way champions respond. We buttoned it up and we took it to them. And again, you had a number of people contributing. The Ohio State defense kept the pressure on and forced the Trojans to punt. Two Rex Kern completions moved the ball to the USC 10, and with just seconds left in the half, Jim Roman kicked a 27-yard field goal to tie the game at 10. The Buckeyes had seized the momentum, and as they went into the locker room, their confidence soared. I don't think at any point did we ever panic. Yeah, like I said, maybe we were just too young and dumb, but we always thought we were going to come back and win the game. As number one Ohio State and number two USC returned to the second half of the 1969 Rose Bowl, one question loomed. Which team would emerge and claim the title of college football's best team? After falling behind 10 to nothing, the Buckeyes appeared to be in for a long afternoon of chasing O.J. Simpson. Being down 10 to nothing, a lot of teams could have lost their poise there, but I think one of the real uh, factors, one of the real strong factors that helped Ohio State in that game is that they really kept their poise. They never lost their confidence that they could come back and win the game. The coaches have said, O.J.'s probably going to get one of us. Not a time to panic, okay? He's a great running back. It happens, you go, well, that's the one. Okay, now we got to keep him from getting any more. Now tied at 10, the Ohio State defense started to put the squeeze on Simpson. Meanwhile, the Buckeye ground game was starting to take control. A third quarter 13 play drive culminated with a 25 yard Jim Roman field goal which put the Buckeyes in the lead 13 to 10. It was Roman's second field goal of the day, a major feat for the Buckeyes' beleaguered kicking game. Our kicking game was a doggone circus, man. It was kind of kicked by committee. We just didn't have a kicker. We had, didn't have a kicker. I kicked off part of the year, shared the kickoff duties with uh, Jim Opperman, kicked a little bit, Timmy Anderson kicked off a little bit, but we couldn't find a place kicker. When Roman came in, it was a lot of fingers crossed, you know, toes crossed, legs crossed, you know, everything, you know, whether it was going to go through or not. Anxiety, yeah, we were anxious about the kid game the entire year, uh, but Pork just kicked it, I mean, just straight and true, kept his head down, made the kick, put us back in the ball game. On the next possession, the Ohio State defense tightened the screws. When a second down sack of quarterback Steve Soggy jarred the ball loose and into Buckeye hands. On second down, quarterback Rex Kern scrambled 15 yards inside the Trojan five to close out the third quarter. 
And on the third play of the fourth quarter, Kern burned the SC defense with a delicate touchdown toss to halfback Leo Hayden. The score was now 20 to 10, but the Buckeyes weren't through yet. Just minutes later, the OSU defense created another critical turnover, this time from the hands of O.J. Simpson. On their very first play from scrimmage, the Buckeyes capitalized on the Simpson miscue when Kern hit reserve wingback Ray Gillian, who scampered in for the score. Gillian's touchdown put the Buckeyes firmly in control, 27 to 10. It also showcased the Buckeyes' wealth of talent. Larry Zelina was hurt in that game early and was replaced by Ray Gillian. Uh, as one indication of the tremendous depth of talent that Woody Hayes had at that time, Ray Gillian may had the baby of the best game of his career. He came in, ran the ball. I mean, didn't miss a beat. Didn't miss a beat, you know? I mean, came in, ran it, touchdown. Hey, what more can you say? Gillian's performance also symbolized the team spirit of the 68 Buckeyes. That fall, Gillian, like many other seniors, had lost his starting job to one of the incoming super sophomores. It was a potentially divisive situation, but any disharmony was quickly replaced by the team's common purpose. A lot of guys in my class were, were slated to be first teamers, and uh, at least four or five of them had to take a back seat and back up somebody because those guys were just a little bit better. And uh, you played it out in practice. Uh, you lost your position, you didn't feel bad about that. You know you had a great team, and that was the main thing, you know, it was a team. You were so in awe of the guys that were playing next to you, and you respected their ability so much, uh, that at least for me, uh, it was an honor for me to be a part of that team, and I was busting my butt to make sure that I was, I was doing everything that I could to contribute to the team. With the national title now within reach, that team concept was on full display on both sides of the ball. The Buckeye defense intercepted two Southern Cal passes and shut down the heralded Heisman winner, Simpson, the rest of the way. He had that one big run, uh, but, uh, but they, he didn't get anything after that. They, they stopped him with that one big run. The only time we made a mistake that whole day, we, he averaged less than a yard a carry, I think, on about 40 other carries. A late disputed touchdown gave the Trojans a measure of respectability. But in the end, there could be no debate over who was the better team that day and who was the best team that year. The 1968 Ohio State Buckeyes are one of the most beloved teams in the history of Ohio State football. Their meteoric rise from hopeful upstarts to national champion is still remembered by a grateful Buckeye nation. But for the men who play, the legacy of victory is best remembered by the special bond they forged, a bond born in the spirit of the team, strong enough to last a lifetime. To come here at this university and be part of this uh, program, I, I know that sounds uh, cliche, but you have to be there just to experience it. You know, you're, you're in a family. I still come back here and I see the same guys like yesterday. I saw Rex and it's just like, you know, it's 1968 again. The same guys, uh, same friendships, uh, it's great. It's an experience that, that really has carried with all of us, I'm sure, for a lifetime. The more time passed, the prouder that we are that we were a part of it, and uh, the more meaning it has for us now that, that the success continues with class and with honor. As Ohio State celebrated its victory over USC and its clinching of the 1968 national title, the Buckeyes were paid a visit by an unexpected guest, USC tailback and Heisman Trophy winner O.J. Simpson. Simpson burst into the Ohio State locker room to congratulate the Buckeyes and state his admiration. You're the best damn team in the country, O.J. gushed. No one could argue. For Buckeye Classics, I'm Archie Griffin. Thanks for watching.